Thank you so much for having me today. Um, when I talk to people about exploring you know, student loan terminology, usually what I get is a blank stare by the end of this uh, particular topic discussion. It is a foreign language, I'm convinced of that. And I just wanna make sure that when people um, hear me talk today for the short time that they're gonna hear, that it's like drinking from the fire hose, and we understand that. So we're gonna send you some additional follow-up tools that you can reference to go back and, and learn more about some of the terminology that is uh, that is presented today. And I know we're gonna have a little bit of a Q&A uh, um, also to answer or clarify anything that comes up. And we also wanna say to you, this is a really high level view. So again, it's like drinking from the fire hose and, hose and looking from a satellite. It's, it's just the surface of student loans. So, we will also provide you at the end of this a website that you can go to to get additional information and run some scenarios for yourself because again this is such an individualized topic what will work for one person may not be the solution and answer for another this is not one size fits all at all so we'll dig in with just taking a step back and talking about the different types of student loans that even exist because there are many. Uh, for most people in today's world, they're gonna have a direct student loan. But previously, there were, there were loans that we call the FFEL. They were the Federal Family Education Loans, and they were actually issued by banks. There was a program that existed, and banks underwrit them but they were guaranteed just like any other student loan. If you are a teacher, there are certain provisions that you want to be aware of for eligibility of forgiveness on an FFEL loan. And in some cases, you never want to consolidate those loans into a direct loan. But and then again, in other cases, you may want to consider it for different eligibility. But teachers in particular want to be aware that the FFEL EL loan has some provisions for forgiveness that are different than the direct loans. So just be aware of that. Those are two different kinds of loans. If you log into your student loan website, you should be able to see whether they're whether the loans that you have are direct or FFEL. Then within the direct loan program, there's two different kinds of loans. There's the subsidized loans and there's unsubsidized loans. And with the subsidized loan, what that means is that you are eligible for the government to pay your interest while you're in college. So they will not, so your interest does not build on top of your student loans while you're in college. These are for undergraduates, so it's not something that you would necessarily see uh, for a professional or graduate level, but they, they would be loans that they're usually income-based eligibility. They are income-based eligibility. And then the second type of undergrad loan that you might be eligible for is an unsubsidized loan. Now, in unsubsidized loans, the interest you'll see you'll see it build separately, and then when you actually start to make the payments at that point in time, usually the interest is capitalized, which means put into the loan, the base loan, for repayment purposes. Unsubsidized loans can be mostly for undergraduate, but also graduate and professional students, and there is no financial need it is needed for unsubsidized loans. Again, if you look at your statement or log into your student loan account, you might see whether your loans are subsidized or unsubsidized. Some of the providers are better at easily disclosing that information than others. A third type of loan is a PLUS loan. Now this is a little confusing because PLUS loans are used usually by parents of undergraduate students, but they're eligible students, professional students and graduates are eligible for PLUS loans above and beyond the parent once they get to that level. So if you're working on your master's degree or if you're a professional student, you're actually eligible for PLUS loans. These loans have a fairly high initiation rate. So we are always try to find other ways um, that we can find funding because like I said, PLUS loans, 
when you take them out, have a pretty good amount that goes to um, even issuing the loan to the lender. There's no financial need for PLUS loans. This is how graduate and professional students end up getting an enormous amount of student loan debt because there's limits on the subsidized and unsubsidized loans, but there's actually no limit on the PLUS loans except up to the need that somebody can actually uh, have as far as assessed for the cost of college. Another type of loan that would happen after somebody graduates is perhaps a consolidation loan. For some people, they're a great idea, and for other people, we caution you because we don't, we want to look and see if you're eligible for some of the, the different kind of repayment plans that are out there. So those are the basic type of uh, education loans. Then once you start to get into payment types, then it gets very confusing. At least in our opinion, this is where the confusion really starts to kick in. The standard type of payment is a 10-year repayment. So if you go on a standard plan, it's expected that you pay your loan back in 10 years. It's an even loan amount that you pay. It's the least expensive if there's no forgiveness eligible for you. And it usually equates to be about 1% of your balance at the time that you start paying. So if your loan is 30,000, then your monthly payment would be relatively close to $300 per month. If your balance is around 50,000, it's 500, and obviously if it's at 100,000, it's close to um, $1,000 a month. Those figures are somewhat crippling when you think about $1,000 a month for somebody coming out of college. But that's where people start to look at either deferring payment a little bit longer or moving into some of the other payment types like graduated. Graduated payments start low, but they increase every two years, like clockwork. This is not income-based. This is just every two years these payments are going to increase. The ten, they generally go for 10 years, but they can be between 10 and 30 years for consolidated loans. If you're not eligible for any kind of public service loan forgiveness, meaning that you work for some sort of charitable or government or educational organization, then a graduated loan may be helpful to you, especially on the consolidated side. It allows those payments to be lower in the first few years, and then as your income goes up, then the payment amounts can, can go up and not impact you as much financially. Then we get into extended payment, which allows repayment up to 25 years. Again, each of these is a bit more expensive because we're stretching out the payment over a period of time, and it's an average of your current interest student loan interest rate uh, that the rate that's used in these situations. Now, on consolidated, depending on whether it's a um, direct loan consolidation or if you go private, you may be able to get less than that. Then we get into income-based repayment. And I go through this fairly slowly because it is as confusing as can be, in our opinion. There are four different types of income-based repayment plans four of them. And we're going to spend different, we're going to spend in the next couple slides, we're going to spend some time digging into those a bit more. And as I mentioned, uh, there are payment types within consolidation loans. So the pros for consolidation is that you can usually get a lower interest rate if you take it from a private loan or from a public loan to a private loan. But understand if you take a direct loan and you make it into a private loan, it is private meaning that you're giving up those government benefits, such as if you become disabled or if you were to pass away, those are loan, those direct loans are um, purposes for, or you can actually have your loans forgiven under those conditions, where with a private loan, that's not necessarily true. So there are pros and cons to consolidations, and there was a great webinar about two weeks ago that you might want to look and see if you can get access to that talks about consolidation loans. So I won't spend a ton of time on that. So um, one thing I do want to say about uh, consolidation is that multiple student loans can be consolidated into one loan through one lender. And the pros are that there are fewer payments to track, right? If you have 
five or six or eight different student loans, the benefits of consolidation is that there's fewer payments to track. Uh, there's the possibility for lower payments by extending the repayment. There are multiple repayment options that you might not have access to if you don't do it. The federal loan consolidation restarts uh, the, the deferment and forbearance clock. And then one other benefit is that the better rates on private loans if your credit score has improved. So sometimes with consolidation loans, um, or sometimes when people have been paying their loans and they go to consolidate, and they use a private lender, then because they've had time to see their credit score increase, then they can get a better uh, rate in that condition. Now, the cons on that is that the loss of the federal loan benefits, which is what I just mentioned, and once you consolidate, you're consolidated. That's it. You can't unconsolidate. You lose existing lender benefits or treatments or terms. And this is where I mentioned early on to be careful with those FFEL loans because you can lose some uh, preferential treatments and terms if you consolidate those loans and don't realize that you have them. Uh, you may end up having two loan payments if federal and private loans are consolidated separately. And one final con, well, that's not final, but one additional con is that you may end up paying more over the life of the loan, especially if you do graduate it. Now, understand when you consolidate through a federal program, consolidation cannot include private loans. So you can't, you can't combine the two sources. However, you can take federal loans and consolidate them into private with other private loans. Federal loans, um, as I mentioned, can be consolidated into a new loan with a private loan. But again, you know, just know that you could lose some, some benefits, uh, such as income-based repayment, deferment, and loan forgiveness. Private loans don't have loan forgiveness. Um, so if you, haven't, if you don't take anything else away from this, one of the biggest things that we hear from people when they come to us is at, they'll ask us a question if they're eligible for income-based repayments, maybe a friend of theirs has done it, and then we get looking at their situation and they consolidated all of their student loans into a private loan, and that negates their eligibility for income-based repayment and forgiveness. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the new interest rates when consolidating federal loans is based on a weighted average of the existing loans, but a private loan consolidation will be based on credit sort and current interest rates. So moving into the next category of the famous income-based repayment plans, I want to go back just a couple of slides for a quick second. And you'll notice that there are four different kinds of income-based repayment plans. Income-based uh, repayment itself, the name income-based repayment, which is IBR, and then pay as you earn falls under income-based repayment, which is what we call pay. And then to confuse it even more, we did a repay. So this is a revised pay as you earn. And then the final type of payment is the income contingent repayment, so an ICR. So these are the, th the four different types of income-based repayment plans that are out there and the initials that go along with them. So when we talk about income-based repayment plans, one of the benefits of those in particular is sometimes when people, uh, and we tell people, especially in your first year of working, do not defer your payment. One of the biggest mistakes that we see is that people uh, go in, they graduate, and then October rolls around, and they think, I can't make these payments. I don't have any income, or I haven't had a chance to get established. You can qualify for an income-based repayment plan. Remember, those are only for the federal loans, but you can qualify for them immediately. And even if you're not in a public service loan position, position you can actually qualify for these income-based repayment plans. Now, why do we tell you don't defer the payments? We actually encourage people to start right away on some of these income-based repayment plans because it looks back at what your income was, and if your income was zero because you were a college student, those payments actually count towards qualifying payment. So if you graduated in May and started making a payment, quote unquote, in June under an income-based repayment plan, that payment starts the clock. And so for many people, that's another one of those things that we see again, that they don't know that they can't, if they can't make the payment, that they can do this kind of 
payment plan and get the clock starting. And if you are in a public service loan position, then we definitely want to get that clock starting ASAP. So let's dig into what the income-based repayment, the IBR, the actual IBR plan is. So what, those, what that plan says is that if you took those loans out prior to 2009, then those loans can be based on 15% of your discretionary income. Now discretionary income look, takes into consideration your income minus the poverty rate, and for most uh, states it's the same, but there's Hawaii and Alaska has a different uh, amount. And then 15% of that would be your IBR payment loans issued after 2014 actually have a 10% discretionary income. So even within the IBR program, we'd have to be looking and seeing when were your loans issued. Then the next type of repayment plan is pay as you earn. That was the pay plan. And those two dates that you have to be aware of are October 1st, new borrowers after October 1st of 2007 and then disbursement of 2011. I know that seems very confusing, but that's the way the regulations are actually written. And then that's 10% of discretionary income. And one of the things about pay as you earn is that you can, um, you can exclude, uh, I'm sorry, you can have Married filing jointly only income and married filing separately would actually be excluded. So when we talk about uh, pay as you earn, or yeah, pay as you earn the pay method, there's actually uh, Becky, one of the uh, wonderful people that works at the firm, just did a whole series on some of these different payment options. And you can find that information on uh, rootedpg.com on the website. And when she broke down the difference between pay and repay, pay was the only, only the income of the borrower is considered if single or married filing taxes separately. So what I'm trying to get at is that if you are somebody who is um, in a public service loan position and your significant other earns a lot of money and you don't, then you may want to take a look at doing a married filing separately because their income would be excluded and therefore the 10% of discretionary income would take your payment down considerably. Then next came the repay program. So in 2015, um, repay came along and they said that's for, you can qualify for repay, that's 10% of discretionary income, but understand that married income is in included and you can't exclude it under the repay program. The payments will be very similar in those two programs, but it will depend, our recommendation often as to which one you should choose depends on the family dem demographics on that program, on those two programs. Um, I want to just point out some of the public service loan uh, servicers because uh, these people will often say to us, we don't know if we have public loans or whether or not we have private loans. If, if you have any of these lenders, uh, Nelnet, Great Lakes, sometimes Naviant is public, sometimes it's private. Fed Loan Servicing, Mohila and the um, HSC Education uh, Financial, those would all be public loans. If you are in any kind of public service loan forgiveness, you should be with Fed Loan Servicing. What we have found as we've been working with people that are eligible for public service loans um, is that they were not in either the right repayment program or they didn't notify, uh, they didn't apply for public service loan forgiveness. One way to know that is if you are with Fed Loan Servicing, um, if you have put in an application, your loans will automatically transfer over to them. Now, the one that I didn't get into very much was the ICR, and again, I'm just going to go back to slide four for a second because I just want to make a quick comment, and in the best interest of time, I won't dig into that too much. Um, but the ICR, the Income um, Contingent Repayment, that is the only program that is available for 
plus loans. So if you are a parent and you are taking out loans for your children and you are in some kind of income or you would qualify for income-based repayment or public service loan forgiveness, this is the only one that is eligible for that. So I just want to mention that real quick. Now, on the private loan side, these are some of the lenders that you, um, these are some of the names that you might be familiar with. They're actual banks, and uh, Sally Mae might be one that falls under there as well. Uh, be careful of high interest rates. Loan forgiveness is extremely rare. And in some cases, we consider home equities for private loans as a way to fund college. Um, there are pros and cons to that. Some of those pros went away under the tax law bill that passed in 2017. Some of the companies that would be uh, private loan refinancing would be SoFi, Credible, Common Bond. These are all companies that would do refinancing on the, the uh, private side. And one thing that we will tell people sometimes is uh, refinancing of, of uh, student loans is not a set it and forget it situation. Sometimes interest rates go down like recently and we want you to take a look at what your interest rate is on a pretty frequent basis because not only do the interest rates go down but your credit score may improve and you would be eligible for lower um, interest rates if your credit score approves. Plus, a lot of these companies will sometimes offer a credit for refinancing, and that will apply towards the cost of your loan. So it's, again, it's not a set it and forget it world when it comes to refinancing in the, in the private side. Now, I've mentioned several times this public service loan forgiveness program, so I'm gonna touch base on this real quick. This is something that we would recommend if you Google this public service loan forgiveness, it'll take you right to the website. You can fill out this service form each year and we encourage you to do that for a couple of different reasons. One is that for public service loan forgiveness to happen, you have to have 120 payments. They do not have to be um, consecutive, but it's 120 qualifying payments, which equates to about 10 years. And it's only on federal loan debt. If you are working for a 501c3, uh, which might be a charitable organization or a high school or elementary school or college, then your loans may qualify. But if you're not filling this form out every year and getting the employer signature, at the time that you may qualify, you're gonna have to go back and get all the signatures. And if you worked for multiple employers, that's really gonna be a problem. So we encourage you to do that every year. It also will catch if a payment is not a qualifying payment and allow us to fix it right then and there instead of waiting until the end and then having to battle through fixing it at the very end. Remember, you must be under the federal direct program, not private, and the FFEL are not eligible for public service loan unless they are consolidated. And again, be very careful with this if you are a teacher because some of these loans, um, the FFLEL loans have their own teacher forgiveness program that you don't want to actually do for public service loan. And you must be on one of the standard or income-based repayment programs. So that graduated and extended program that I mentioned are not qualifying programs. I have had people ask me, is public service loan forgiveness going to be around for 10 years? Um, we cannot predict what Congress will do. So we encourage people to set aside the money that they're saving in an investment account just in case. Um, if you're not eligible for public service loan, then we're going to tell you to set money aside because you still could be eligible for income-based repayments. Uh, we would have you set the side, money aside for um, the tax potential tax situation that you may encounter uh, once the loan is forgiven. Um, in the past, what has happened when Congress has made any changes to any kind of student loan uh, items, then they usually grandfather it, like we mentioned in 8793 and 2014 with pay. Repay tells us that it, it is encouraging because remember, that's the one that um, remove some of the caps and again sort of grandfathered in in some things so frequently asked questions tend to be around the married filing separately loophole um, some people will switch from repay to pay 
and file taxes separately. Remember, if you're not eligible for, uh, and you want to make sure that you run the numbers on the tax consequences, because when you do married filing separately, you do lose some things. So we always want to run those uh, tax consequences to make sure that it makes sense for you. Uh, remember that when you do consolidation, uh, it resets the clock on public service loan forgiveness. So if you have been in any kind of student loan, uh, or uh, if you are in public service loan and you've been, your loans have been separated and you turn around and consolidate, it completely resets that clock. So be very, very, very cautious with that. And another question that people ask us is if student loans are um, taxable when they're forgiven. If you are in a public service loan forgiveness program, the answer is no. If you are in income-based and non-public service loan, then technically the letter of the law says yes. So after 20 or 25 years, you could actually owe tax on any amount that's forgiven, which is why we tell people to put money aside for that particular event. Resources that we would recommend that you go out and do some um, additional um, reading on. Student Loan Hero is incredible. It's a great resource, wonderful information. And then studentloans.gov, studentaid.edu.gov. This does some wonderful repayment modeling. So if you're looking for a free resource to do repayment modeling, this is a great web, um, website. AskHeatherJarvis.com gives some wonderful information, and then ForgiveMyDebt.org is another great website. With that, I know I've just thrown a lot of information at you. I'm happy to take any questions that you all might have. Great. Thank you, Amy. I'll remind everyone, if you have a question, you can use the chat box or you can email info at SavvyLadies.org. And one of the questions that came in during your presentation is asking for you to explain an initiation rate. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, so when you apply for a student loan, um, whether it's a public or whether it's a um, just a regular standard, like a direct loan or a plus loan, plus loans, uh, so let me, let me bring up the exact amount. So plus loans, have a cost that they, an out, like an applicant, no, that's not the right word either. It's not an application fee per se, but it's an issue fee, right? So when, when somebody fills out an application, then they'll tell you exactly how much you're eligible for. So then they'll tell you the amount that you're going to receive and then the amount that the issuer ends up getting for issuing the loan. So when, when we look at the different costs associated with like a direct loan versus a plus loan, the fees are much higher. I think it's around 7% in total um, to that you end up sort of quote unquote losing uh, for the, the cost of that loan. So the lender gets, that's kind of their fee for issuing the loan. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, the next question is saying, I co-signed my son's college loan. I'm low income and I'm struggling to make any payments at all. My son tells me he can't contribute. Are there any options for me as a parent? Well, I think there's options for your son, actually. Um, I would kind of back it up to that. If he can't make the payment, is it a, 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 this is assuming that it's a public loan. If he can't make the payment, then I would encourage him to apply for income-based repayment because if his income is very low, then he may be eligible for zero amount payment. But even if he's not eligible for zero amount, it may get the payment down, if you're making the payment, it may get the payment down to a more reasonable figure that you're paying. Um, if, if it's a private loan, that's gonna be a little bit of a different challenge because they're usually, the only thing that you probably can do is extend the loan out just a little bit further. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is asking about the payment types that you talked about. Mm -hmm. If I have what I think are standard payments, can I 
simply change them to income-based repayments? You certainly can. Um, one of the things, I'm just going to go back to that slide. So if you're in a standard payment and you're struggling to, to live, um, which is a lot of cases is the truth, um, then you can switch to one of these income-based repayment plans that are listed or any of the repayment plans actually um, to make it a little bit easier on yourself. If you are in a job where you would be eligible for public service loan forgiveness, then we want to absolutely switch you to an income-based repayment plan. So you can switch. And if you are in a, a job that's, uh, again, eligible for uh, public service loan forgiveness, then at that point in time, I would immediately apply for a PSFL because those payments that you have been making under standard, you know, could qualify. Just don't let them consolidate when you do that. That's the only thing that I want to share with you. Um, I, and I don't, when I say what I'm about to say, I do not mean this in a derogatory format, but when you call these companies, whoever is your loan servicer, they are working in a call center. They do not know the rules and regulations behind student loan repayment. And so I would encourage you to do some homework um, and make sure that you know going into the phone call exactly what um, payment you want because that they don't they honestly and I don't mean it you know to be mean or anything like that they just that's not what they're paid to do they're paid to take a request they are not paid to give you advice and that's where we've seen a lot of people get into trouble is that the person on the phone that they spoke to um, didn't know the rules and so for example, took a sta standard loan, consolidated it, and then put them on income-based repayment, and they had to restart the clock on that particular situation. Okay, that's very, very helpful information. Thank you. And I believe this is the last question, which is asking or saying, I've heard some different things about working at a nonprofit or government agency and how you can qualify for loan forgiveness, yep. but it's for 10 years. My federal loan repayment plan is for 10 years. So how does that work? Yeah, so, so you, you just talk a little bit about that? Yep. So it sounds like if your federal loan repayment plan is for 10 years, you're probably on the standard payment plan. And in order to get forgiveness, if there's anything left after the 10 years, like let's say that 10 years in, you know, you, I don't know, you um, have a small balance left because there's one month in the 10 year cycle, then that amount would be forgiven. But if you're on this 10 year repayment plan already and you're on public service loan forgiveness, you may be able to switch it to that income based repayment, sort of like the last question is, and be eligible to lower your payments and then have forgiveness done after those 120 qualifying payments. I would, I would actually have you apply for public service loan forgiveness under the standard plan just to make sure that they recognize right now the, the qualifying payments that you've already made and then we could go the next layer. So you would need to get started initially. It doesn't recognize back. It doesn't. Um, if you right, no. If you've uh, been working for that same, great question. If you've been working for that same non for profit the whole time that you've been making student loan repayments, those um, payments will likely qualify. So let's say that you've been four years in for the non-for-profit that you've been working for and that entire time you've been making payments on the plan, then I would fill out the public service loan forgiveness application. Note that you've been with them, have the HR department or director sign off on that and have them start the clock on that loan forgiveness uh, so that all of those four years worth of payments um, have already have already. The clock had already started. It would actually start four years ago, and then you'd only have six years left in the uh, repayment program. And that's where we could talk about what you know what would be the next step after that. Okay, great. Does that Thank make sense? And 
Yeah, and just want to go back real quick when we were talking about those PLUS loans, and uh, I, I Googled it real quick because I couldn't remember the exact amounts off the top of my head. Those origination fees um, that I was talking about, you know, when you take out a loan and the cost associated with it. So when you take out a... Um, when you take out a loan, whether it's a direct loan or a plus loan, each of those has an origination fee. And as of right now, the parent loan, the plus loan origination fee is 4.276%. So for every 5,000, so for example, if you took out $5,000 in um, parent loans, then you're going to have to pay $213 for the loan origination fee, and the school's only going to receive $4,700 in that situation. Whereas with the direct loan, it's a lot less expensive. Um, if you had $5,000, then the origination fee is quite low. It would only be like $53.45, and so the school will receive the majority of the money. So you know, looking at those two figures that I just mentioned, two hundred and thirteen dollars and eighty cents and fifty three forty five, that's a pretty big difference that the that the school is missing out on that you have to make up some other way. Um, so that's just again some important um, that's prior to even taking out the loan, which I could do a whole nother class on that in and of itself. <laughs> people were interested. Uh, but I do want to mention, I just briefly mentioned that um, there's some great resources in the slides. And one that I didn't, I was remiss on, is our resources as well. If you go to rootedpg.com, uh, there is one of our blogs that's listed is uh, Student Loan Tips by Becky Partridge. It should actually say Becky Eason, as she got married earlier this year. Uh, but each week she publishes a tip on student loans. Uh, all of that is free education that's available to you. And um, there's a lot of content out there already that you could just read down through and get familiar with. And as I also mentioned, one of the websites that you can go out to and model, do some uh, modeling is at studentaid.edu.gov. Uh, we're always happy to point you to resources where you can get some credits if you do um, Refinancing, we don't get anything from that. We just are glad that people can get a little extra money uh, through, um, you know, applying for consolidation or um, shouldn't be consolidation, but refinancing of their loans. Uh, so we can, we'd be happy to point you in those directions if it's the right answer for you as well. So I hope this was helpful. Yes, thank you so much, Amy. I want to thank you for really taking the time to explain everything very clearly and walking walking it walking through it with us um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today uh, we will be sending out the information and the links here that Amy mentioned but Amy can you say again the the website for your company so everyone has that name it's rooted so r o o t e d p g dot com so it stands for rooted planning group okay Great. So we will be sending that out if you didn't have a chance to write it down. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much, Amy. It was really excellent. Thank Great. you. Bye-bye.